time, there were novelty computer books. There was, you know, how to train your computer mouse. There was a bunch of other, you know, stupid DOS tricks. And we figured that this will be another novelty book and that people will like it. Well, it sold. And it sold really, really well. I had an idea to do a beginning book about computers, about DOS specifically, and I kind of inspired myself to do that just dealing with people uh, in a magazine editing job I had, and being on the radio at that time, and, and being out in the public and talking to people about computers. It was obvious that people wanted to learn more, but the material we had available at the time just wasn't doing the job. We had beginner books on how to use computers, but they sucked. They just didn't have that, you know, they were condescending, they were patronizing, the author was arrogant, he was like, well, you're, you'll never get this stuff anyway, or like, hey, look at this, this is cool, and it was like, people didn't want to, to know that, they wanted to use the computers, we were moving out of an era where computers were a hobbyist thing, were just basically like ham radio operators, to where they were going into the office, and so there were people who were transitioning from uh, typewriters and going into computers and, and doing things in a ledger to doing them on a computer. So you had mortal users who needed to know how to use a computer. And the books were missing the mark. And so I had an idea based on the Idiot's Guide to Volkswagen you know, Maintenance to do an Idiot's Guide for Computers. And that was my proposal. And this is about 1989 or so. I wanted to get that out there. And I had a literary agent. Believe it or not, computer book authors have literary agents. And I wrote up a proposal, and I gave it to him, and I said, shop this around. And he shopped it around to all the major publishing houses at the time. None of them were interested. There was a lot of hesitancy about writing to the beginner crowd. And it was a catch-22. They set themselves up for it. They wrote lousy books, so the lousy books didn't sell. So when I wanted to write a beginner's book, their argument was, well, our beginner books don't sell. That audience just isn't there. And, and I was like, well... You know, but you're not trying to get the audience because your books are unsuccessful. But you know, and they wouldn't listen because it was, it was kind of like you know the bland food restaurant. It's like people don't want salt, you know, in their food, and, and it's like, well, you haven't tried it yet. Well, we don't want to try it because they're just not going to like it. We're already getting people to come in, and uh, you know, it's tough to convince people of that. So I just put it on the shelf, continued to write books. I was at a computer book publishing conference. And I was uh, addressing the, the idea of having books be more personality driven. I said the problem with computer books is they're dry, they're boring, they're not an interesting read. And in the audience was a man, Mac McCarthy, and he was with a startup publisher called IDG Books. And he said, let's have lunch. So we had lunch, and after lunch he said, I have an idea for a book. It was a book, it was not a series, it was a book. And he said, it's called DOS for Dummies. And I, oh, I have the outline for that book. And my book's called The Idiot Guide for DOS. I said, this is, it's the same thing. And so he said, shoot me a copy of your, your, your outline. And so I, I FedExed it to him because we didn't really have FTP or email back then. And he said, this is awesome. This is exactly what I'm looking for, except I wrote a tutorial, a how-to. And he said, you know, they don't want to learn this stuff. So let's make it a reference so that they can just look up the one thing they want to find the answer to and get on with the rest of their lives. They don't want to become experts. And I said, gotcha. I know what you're talking about. And three weeks later, I'd written the book. IDG originally planned to publish one book, and uh, even then, there was some reluctancy with the title when the, when the owner found out that they had this book, DOS for Dummies, at the press. He's like, you can't offend the reader. Cancel that book. And unfortunately, well, or fortunately, 5,000 copies came off the press. Originally, it was going to be 7,500, but they stopped it at 5,000. And they figured, okay, we'll shove this out in the marketplace and it'll just go away. Um, at the time, not all the bookstores even wanted to have it. I mean, they were like Walden Books said, no, we don't, want to, we don't want to insult our reader. We don't want that. But even with just 5,000 copies out there, and this is before the internet, this is before, uh, you know, when we had bookstores, real bookstores that people went into, um, they came in and it was gone. In a week it was sold out because people wanted it. It was like they just saw it and they said, that's for me. I'm a dummy. I want that book. And so, to the publisher's credit, they printed up another 5,000 copies and another 5,000 copies and another 5,000 copies because the, the, the bookstores just wanted the book and eventually Walden Books was tired of sending people across the mall to be Dalton and they said, okay, we'll take that book too. And so, 
It just, it built on that. It was completely word of mouth. After DOS for Dummies became successful, the publisher recognized they had a success, and so they were eager to get more books out there because they realized we have a formula. We've hit upon it. We have an audience that is just eager for a lot of information. So they sat down with me, and they basically offered me every title that I wanted, whatever I wanted to do. I think I signed six contracts in an afternoon. And then they went out to other people and found other, other writers to write things on... Um, you know, Photoshop and uh, home finance and all these other computer titles. I mean, they were just doing all these titles at once because, and everything is old because people were just eager to have the information presented in a format that was easy to read, that had a little bit of humor in there, that was uh, personality and all that stuff. People were ready for it. They were hungry for it. And the books just sold like hell. So this, this is a chronological order here. So those are the early books that I, that I wrote, which are kind of technical. And some of them actually did sell really well. And then all of a sudden you have DOS for Dummies. And you can see that, that if you, you know, look chronologically, there were just, and I wrote other books, technical books, hard disk management and, you know, uh, stacker. And then all of a sudden you see another Dummies book and another Dummies book. And then there's other books that come along and then there's another Dummies book and another Dummies book. And as time progresses, I wrote more and more and more. And that kind of parallels the For Dummies series because as it started going, it just started ramping up and then all of a sudden, you know, so at, at the one end of the spectrum, you see lots of different colors, and at the other end, it's all yellow. <laughs> and that's a lot of that is simply because, well, the economy, and I mean, you know, going away from, from physical bookstores, the Wiley, the For Dummies brand survived, and a lot of the other stuff really didn't. I mean, it has niche markets, but there's only, say, three or four publishers today that publish computer books versus this time, way back in the 1980s, when you probably had 16 publishers. Then this is, this is my collection of, of knockoffs. This is the knockoff collection. So what happened when after DOS for Dummies came out and was popular, you had all kinds of titles that tried to capitalize on it. So you had DOS for non-nerds, I hate DOS, Idiot Guides to DOS, Voodoo DOS, Real Men Use DOS. And there were a couple of other ones, but one of the reasons I got these is because in the books, I see a lot of my own writing, which, you know, you can call that plagiarism, but when was the last time you heard a plagiarism case in court? Uh, you know, it happens all the time. And so I would go through these books and flag where I saw things that I had written appearing in someone else's book. And sometimes it was really bad. In fact, one of the worst examples was this one up here, which was not a For Dummies title, which was just like, oh my God, did I write this? I mean, I remember talking to my publisher and I, I was saying, should I get paid for this book? But, you know, it, th that doesn't happen as much anymore. But back then they were so eager to capitalize on the success of the For Dummies series that they... They came up with a lot of different, they tried to figure out how does it work. I remember an editor telling me that she counted the, the number of paragraphs between jokes because she thought that was important. And I'm like, but that wasn't it. I mean, it, I, I had no formula when I wrote the thing. I just, whatever crazy thought popped into my head. For Dummy series today is better than it has been. I mean, for a while there, there was just this mad rush to do as many books as possible. So it was kind of that corporate mentality of let's keep printing money as opposed to what's our mission statement. I'm more of a mission-oriented guy. It's like, what is the mission? Is the mission to provide information to people? Or is the mission to go ahead and make as much money as possible? I think the better is to go ahead and provide the information. And back then, say 10, 15 years ago, their mission was completely just, let's saturate the market. Let's do as many books as we can. Let's just get anyone to write the books so that we can get as many out there. And I think that hurt them in the long run. And, and like, it, like it hurt everyone. I mean, you don't talk about global economy. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a quality equation here. And I, as an author, I know I tried to do this, and Andy Rathbone, who did Windows for Dummies, and David Pogue, who was writing Mac for Dummies at the time, we tried to explain them. Keep the quality there. Don't go for this, you know, this saturation. Just keep the good authors, do the good books. And I think that was kind of lost because it was this dot-com thing that was going on at the time, and everyone was like, let's make money. And so the company actually made a terrible mistake, and it decided to become a publicly traded company. And that really screwed it up. I mean, it really, totally, the, the corporate mentality was one of let's make the quarterly numbers, and I think that, that hurt them a lot. In fact, it, it folded the company. And then Wiley, which is a, traditionally a, a textbook publisher and a, and a more... Uh, traditional publisher went, on, went ahead and bought it. And this is about, oh, uh, you know, 13 years ago. And when they took it over, I think they uh, once again understood the value of bringing the quality back into it. And it's taken some time. But these days, it, I am very pleasantly surprised at the quality of these books.
I think that the series has been successful because the, the publisher really understood and appreciated what was special about the books. But it's not just about humor. It's not just about, oh my God, here's a bunch of books with a bunch of jokes in them. It's like it has to be good information. So if you look at technical books these days, they are all that way. I mean, it's not the old way where everything was dry and boring. It's like, here's the facts. Da, 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 da. Now it's pretty interesting. Even the propeller-headed books that I read that are like really nerdy technical books on things that maybe 200 people are going to understand, there's still that same personality in there. So it, not only is it this the Four Dummies series, but it's the entire industry has appreciated the value that personality can bring to these dull, boring topics.